Duo Ministry. I've been a very happy client for many years, and I want to personally thank them all. And if you're able to help in any way, it would be awesome. If we can all contribute a little bit, everyone's burdens can hopefully be met. Okay, shameless plug over. Now to the scripture reading. Today I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, and then skipping to 20 to 25. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and speaks in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, Will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, and he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Thanks, Maribel. Well, at this time, uh, if you have uh, young people uh, worshiping with you and they would like to go to Children's Chapel, uh, ages five through nine are welcome to, to join the folks at the back door there. And I can already see most of them are already making their way there. <clears throat> We're, uh, we're studying the book of 1 Corinthians. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And um, not only are we studying this as we, as we meet each Sunday morning, but uh, we have a, a, a whole host of small groups within our church that we call growth groups. Um, some of these groups, most of the groups probably meet weekly. Some of them um, meet a little less frequently than weekly. And many of those groups are also studying the passages of Scripture that we're, that we're studying in, in the context of our message on Sunday morning as well. Uh, and I just want to take a moment just to, to mention that to you, to say um, we have, I would say in terms of adults, we have close to 200 people involved in these growth groups, and that's wonderful. And, and one of the reasons it's so, it's so wonderful is because many people will come to a church like ours. We're not the biggest church in the world, but we're big enough that if you only come on Sunday morning, you could find yourself thinking, I feel like I'm bouncing off people. You know, I, I come and there's a lot of people, but it's really hard to connect with people on a Sunday morning in a group of people this size. And that's really what growth groups are about. Growth groups are, are to help you to connect relationally within the body of Christ. And so if you're not in a growth group, I would, I would offer you, I would invite you to consider uh, being a part of a growth group, because until you're a part of a group like that, you will very likely find that our church, as, as much as we pride ourselves in being warm and friendly, you may experience us not so much that way. Um, and so if you'd like to learn more about what it would be to be a part of a growth group, uh, contact the church office. Uh, we will help you navigate your way. Um, I also want to say, if you are leading a growth group, um, or you are interested in learning more about learn, leading a growth group, we would have, we'd like to have a, a training time uh, two weeks from yesterday on Saturday morning, January 28th, from 9 in the morning till noon, right here in the sanctuary. We would, we're going to be having a growth group leaders uh, training seminar. And it's very important. We, would, we really desire that all of our growth group leaders, if possible, would attend with us. 
Um, maybe you're not the leader of a growth group, but you find yourself helping at times to facilitate your discussion in your group. Um, the more the merrier. This is not an exclusive elite group. Uh, we would like to have as many people as possible attend this training with us. And so please mark your calendar, Saturday, January 28th, 9 a.m. until noon. We would love to have you join us for that. Well, as we turn our attention now to, to the passage of Scripture that Maribel read for us, I've heard it said that the difference between knowledge and wisdom is that knowledge has to do with what you know, and wisdom has to do with what you do with what you know. And I think this makes, makes sense. Another way maybe of thinking of this is, is that the truth, of, the truth that knowledge becomes wisdom when we learn how to integrate new knowledge with what we already know. And so what we're doing this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're looking at, at, at this portion of Scripture where Paul is sort of integrating what, what he's been teaching us over the last couple of sections of Scripture into to this area of spiritual gifts. So if you remember back, you might remember, this has been a little over a month ago now that we looked at chapter 12, but in chapter 12, we learned that unity in the body of Christ and, and the mutual edification and building up of the body of, body of Christ is of much greater importance and greater significance than our individual diversity of our backgrounds and our giftedness. In other words, our unity together is actually greater than our diversity individually. That's not to say that our diversity doesn't matter, but Paul is saying if you had to value one over the other, the diversity serves the unity. Our individuality serves the whole, and so our unity together is actually greater than our individual diversity. And then last week, when we looked at chapter 13, Paul challenged us to value love above the spiritual gifts. In other words, to, to value the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, as being of greater value to us than than our giftedness in the sense that our giftedness tends to reflect back on ourselves. Because while these spiritual gifts will pass away, he says love will never fail. So the spiritual gifts, as valuable as they are to our serving and loving one another, many of these spiritual gifts will pass, but love will never fail. And so today we're kind of taking those big ideas, and he's applying these big ideas now to two particular spiritual gifts, the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of tongues. And basically what he's saying here as he applies these values, he's saying building up the body of Christ and, and per, the pursuit of love, he's, he's urging us to do this as we celebrate these and use these, these gifts of tongues and prophecy. And so the way that, that this works out is that, that he actually begins by arguing for the supremacy or the superiority of the gift of prophecy over the gift of tongues. Now, you may not recall this because it's been a little over a month since we looked at chapter 12, but one of the things that I suggested back then was sort of a, a definition for these, these two gifts. We looked at a whole host of gifts in a, in a broad brush, but, but let me just remind you, I, I think that, that a helpful way of understanding the gift of prophecy is that prophecy is the ability to proclaim new revelation as well as to proclaim truth that is already revealed in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when we talk about the gift of prophecy, the emphasis is on the content of what we're declaring or what we're delivering. Okay, the gift of prophecy, the emphasis is on the content of what is being communicated. I also suggested that when we think of the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues could be understood this way, that it is the ability to declare God's truth in a language or in languages that, are, that were previously unknown to the one doing the speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So whereas prophecy, in prophecy, the emphasis is on the content of what is being said, in the gift of tongues, the emphasis is on the language by which that content is being delivered or spoken. Paul's logic here is, is really pretty simple. He's saying, in the spirit of love, in the context of the church, prophecy benefits everyone. Because with prophecy, everyone can understand it. Because the presumption is that, that it's being delivered in a, in, a, in a language that everyone in the room can process. But tongues only benefits, there's, only has benefit if there is someone else in the room who understands the language that's being communicated in the tongue. Either because they know the language already, or because they have the, the gift of interpretation, which is, is another spiritual gift. And so Paul is, is starting to build his case, to build his argument for, for his preference for the gift of prophecy over the gift of tongues. So that, and, and not only that, by the way, he's also building an argument for all spiritual gifts that benefit the whole body, that benefit everyone in the family of God, not just those who happen to know that particular tongue that's being spoken. Now, if you're anything like me, as I, as I process this and I think about this, there's still sort of this burning question in my mind, what are these gifts? I mean, I, I get there's sort of a definition of them here, but, but what's the significance of these gifts? Not just what's the value of them, but, but how, do they, how do they work in the bigger picture of what God is doing in the world and in our lives. And so let me take a couple of minutes to, to try to unpack these gifts a little more or unwrap these gifts a little bit with you. That was terrible, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, so let's start with, with prophecy. When we hear the word prophecy, I think it's very natural for, for many of us to think about the predicting of the future. Right? When you think of someone that's prophetic or you think of someone who is prophesying, we tend to think that there is some element that has to do with predicting the future. And the reason for that is that historically, in the Old Testament and even in, in certain instances in the New Testament, prophets were sent by God to, to call people to faith in the Lord. And in many cases, the people that the prophet is speaking to are going through something difficult. They've, they have been carried off into exile from their homeland, or they are in bondage to some other nation, or there's, there's the presence of some kind of famine that has overtaken their land. And so the prophet would call the people to repent, to turn away from their sinfulness, and to return to trusting God. The Lord, And in many instances, what the prophet would do is the prophet would then tell the people what the Lord is going to do for them or to them if they don't have faith. And so there is this predictive aspect of, of prophecy. But in its purest sense, prophecy is not necessarily about the future. Prophecy in its, in its purest understanding is simply declaring or proclaiming or announcing the word of God. Thus saith the Lord is typically the way that, that prophets begin their, their prophecy. But there's another wrinkle when we think about prophecy. Some prophets, I, I, I will refer to these prophets as capital P prophets. Some prophets proclaim the word of God that has only re been revealed to the prophet. In other words, when the prophet gets up in front of the people, the prophet says, God has told me something, but he has not told you yet, and I, am, I have been commissioned by God to deliver to you this message that God has only delivered to me. That's sort of what I would refer to as a capital P prophet. But I think there are also small p prophets who have been called by God to proclaim God's Word, but it's God's Word, for the most part, that has already been revealed. It's already been revealed, and it's available and accessible. 
in the scriptures. It's not new revelation. It's not, it's not the prophet saying, God has told me something that he hasn't told you. It's the prophet saying, God has revealed this to us in his word, but I want to remind you. I want to call you back to it. I want to teach you and exhort you from it. I think that's what preachers are today. That preachers today are small p prophets. In fact, if you didn't get this idea from last week, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and make it even worse by saying it again. I tend to believe that for the most part, capital P prophecy is a gift that has for the most part ceased to be operative in our current day. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to die on the stake for that. That's not a salvation issue. In other words, I don't think you have to believe what I believe on that in order to be a Christian. I don't believe that at all. I think godly men and women can disagree on this issue. But the reason that, that I believe this is because I believe that when the written word of God in the scriptures was made complete, then there was no longer the need for the capital P prophecy because God's revelation has been made known to us. I think this is why Paul says, as he is writing the inspired word of God to the church in Corinth, he says, where there are prophecies, they will cease. I also think it's why the Apostle John, at the close of his book, writing the book of Revelation, says in chapter 22, verse 18, anyone who adds anything that is written in this, adds anything to what is written in this book will be cursed by God. And so that's sort of a nuanced you know, way of thinking about capital P prophets versus lowercase p prophets. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that clearly the gift of prophecy has to do with declaring and proclaiming the Word of God. Now let's look a little bit at the gift of tongues. And here I would suggest that there are two different activities that are mentioned in the Bible that are associated with the gift of tongues. One of these activities is similar to, pro- to, to prophecy in that it involves the declaring of God's Word to people, but it's doing it in a language, in, in different, uh, the difference is that in the gift of tongues, it's doing it in a language that is not previously known by the one who is speaking. And so we're, we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But that's one of the the, the activities that I think the Bible talks about in terms of speaking in tongues. The other activity that's associated with the gift of tongues is really prayer. In fact, I would suggest to you that virtually every instance of speaking in tongues that you and I have heard about or or tend to encounter in the the present-day church is probably this, that that it's really more praying in a tongue. Praying using words that we don't understand. Or praying using words that frankly may not be words at all. At least not in in a known language in the world today. Paul talks about this here in this passage in in verse 14, which we didn't read. But but he he does talk about it. He says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what do I do with that? Well, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. And I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will also sing praise with my mind. Paul doesn't seem to be a big fan of being in the spirit, but being out of your mind. In fact, he said that. He said that in the passage of Scripture that we've already heard, where where he says, if people who don't have faith come in in your midst and everyone is speaking in tongues, what are they going to think? They're going to think that you're out of your minds. And that's not good. But where I want to spend the rest of our time this morning is really looking more deeply at this aspect of speaking in tongues that's associated with proclaiming God's Word in a language that you don't speak. Language that the, that the preacher doesn't really speak. And in order to get a perspective on this phenomenon, I think, I think really the best place to go in the Scriptures is the place in the Scriptures where this kind of speaking in tongues first, take, first took place, 
And that's in the book of Acts chapter 2. I'm not going to read this for you. It's a long passage of Scripture. I, if, I, if I really were going to read it for you, I would read Acts chapter 2, 1 through 24. And that's a pretty sizable section of Scripture. And so what I would really urge you is if you have access to, your, to a Bible, either in the pew there or on your phone or what have you, or you, that you brought it with you, um, to open to, to Acts chapter 2 and just kind of survey the passage as, as we talk about it together here. Well, here's, here's basically what's going on in Acts chapter 2. There are three, three big things that I'll highlight for us. First of all, the disciples are in the midst of the city of Jerusalem. And it's, during, it's, it's in preparation for and, and the celebration of the feast called Pentecost. And so what, what's happening is that the city of Jerusalem is swollen with the presence of ethnically Jewish people. But they have come from virtually every culture in the known world in the Roman Empire. So ethnically, they are all Jewish, but culturally, it's a melting pot. Because, because during this time, the Jewish people, the, the people who are ethnically Jewish and religiously Jewish, have actually been scattered all over the known world. But during these high holidays, they make the trek back to Jerusalem. And so at, at festivals like this, the city is filled with ethnically Jewish people, religiously Jewish people, but people who are culturally very diverse. Another, another factor in this has to do with their language. That's one of the ways that their cultural diversity shows up is because they are ethnically Jewish, they're religiously Jewish, but because they live in these, these varying places within the Roman Empire, they, all, they speak all kinds of different languages. Maybe something that would give you a sense of what this might look like is when you think about people, most, most of us know people who are either second or third generation immigrants to our country. Some of you may be second or third generation immigrants to our country. And so you know, if, if, you, if you have experience with this, you know that people who are second and third generation, they're ethnically still from their homeland. There, there are things about them that, that still very much make them a part of, of where they are from. But you know when you talk to them that you're talking to someone who has basically lived their whole life in America because their English is like ours, their accent is just like ours, and so they may still have the ethnic things that make them unique, but culturally, in terms of language and their practice and the way that they tend to function in, in society, they're no different from anybody, anybody else. That's sort of what we're dealing with here. These are people who are ethnically and religiously Jewish, but culturally they're just like the people where they come from. So the next thing that we see in, in this passage is that the Holy Spirit then descends on the disciples, and they begin to speak, okay? And they begin to speak. Verse 11 of, of Acts chapter 2 tells us they begin to speak declaring the mighty works of God, presumably declaring the mighty works of God that have to do with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they're, they're talking about the things that God has done, but here's what's interesting. Everyone in the crowd is hearing them in their own language. That's the miracle. You see, the disciples, what would be the native language of the disciples? It was Aramaic, which is just a variation on, on Hebrew. But all the disciples that, that, we're, that are listed for us in the 12 disciples, those are disciples that Jesus has called to himself in and around Jerusalem. But at Pentecost, you've got all these people who are coming from all over the Roman Empire who speak all these different, these different languages but all of these diverse Jews are hearing the disciples who speak Aramaic. They're hearing them in their own language. That's the miracle. You might even argue that, that the miracle isn't tongues. The miracle is ears. Right? The miracle is in the hearing almost. And then in response to all this, because there's a lot of confusion now, the people who are hearing are saying, how is this happening? 
And so Peter then stands up in the midst of the people and he explains this phenomenon and he explains it against the backdrop of two different contexts. The first context that he, that he talks about is he says, this, what's happening here in our midst is happening in fulfillment of what was spoken about by the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. Joel chapter 2, particularly, which talks about the Lord's day, the day of the Lord, which is a very prophetic, messianic way of talking about the future. There is going to be a day, the day of the Lord, when the anointed one, where the Messiah will come and he will bring healing and restoration to Israel. So that's, so Peter says, what you're seeing here is, it needs to be understood against that backdrop, what Joel has said about tongues, foreign languages, and the day of the Lord. And then the other context that he highlights is he says what's happening here is all happening in connection to the, to the life and the death and the resurrection of this man, Jesus Christ. In other words, what, what Peter is saying is that that if you want to understand what's happening, then you understand that, this, that you need to understand this is connected to the ministry, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it is in fulfillment of the prophecy regarding the day of the Lord, which was a big-time Old Testament prophetic idea. Now, I want you to think about something here. I want you to try to put yourself in the place of a Jewish person in this crowd. It doesn't matter where, what, where you're from. It doesn't matter, you know, what kind of culturally Jewish person you might be. It's just a Jewish person who is ethnically and religiously Jewish. You may not be an expert in the Scriptures, but as a Jewish person, you would certainly be familiar with the first five books of the law, which we would see as the fi first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You're standing in the midst of a virtual table of nations. Okay, you may not have Acts chapter 2 in front of you, but, but it's listed in verses 8 to 12 in Acts chapter 2. There's sort of a, a summarizing of all the different cultures that are represented at Pentecost in Jerusalem at that time. Now, I won't read it for you, but I'll let you see it on the screen. But you can see it's a whole litany of these different cultures that are represented in the crowd as Peter is, is preaching to them. And so you're standing in a virtual table of nations, and you are witnessing a miracle, something supernatural that has to do with languages. Does this call to your mind anything that you've ever heard about? Does this ring any bells for you? I think it would. And I think what it would call to your mind is what happened in Genesis chapter 11. Because in Genesis chapter 11, <clears throat> this is, this is where, where what happened with the Tower of Babel took place where the nations of, of the earth have come together. The families of the earth came together. They all spoke the same language, and they said, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's, let's exalt ourselves. In fact, let's build a tower that will reach into the heavens so that we can attain, we can, we can get to heaven, and we don't even need God to help us do it. So let's... Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's come together and promote our own unity and let's reach into the heavens and we don't even need God to get there. And God, there's humor in the Bible, by the way, it says that God knelt down to see their tower. Okay? And so he, he stoops down to see their tower, but he sees what they're doing. He sees that even though he has made them to be one with Him, to be one, yes, unified, but to, to, to be one in a relationship with Him, the one who made them. But they have exchanged that purpose for just seeking to be one without Him. And so what does God do? God confused their language that day. 
He confused their language supernaturally in such a way that there was chaos. And the people were scattered throughout the earth. And from that time on, that's been the circumstance. But here's what's interesting. You, you, you can see here that in Genesis chapter 11, God was recognizing that the people had exchanged the purpose of being one in a relationship with God for being one in just making a name for themselves, not one with God. Don't you see that that's what sin is? I know that sin manifests itself in our, in our attitudes, in our mind, in our actions, the way we just process all of life. But when you really boil it all down, sin is our failure to glorify God and to exchange the, glorif the glorification of God for our own glory, for the promotion of ourselves. And so God divided mankind. But notice that when the historical narrative picks back up in Genesis chapter 12, who's the first person that we meet? It's a man named Abram. We know him as Abraham. God picks one man, one family. And he says in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, that which the people at Babel were, were seeking to have. And he says, and you will be a blessing. He goes on at the bottom of verse 3 and he says, And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Ultimately, who would be Abraham's greatest descendant? It's none other than Jesus himself. In Genesis chapter 11, God drove the nations out. He confused their language and he drove them out of his presence. In Acts chapter 2, though, through the work of Jesus Christ... And in the giving of his spirit, God is calling the nations back to himself. Do you see what is happening in Acts chapter 2? It is the undoing of Babel. It's the anti-Babel. God is calling the nations back to himself. But do you know what the problem was in Corinth? The problem with the church in Corinth is that many of the Corinthians had experienced this miraculous sign. The Spirit had come on them and they had experienced the phenomenon of speaking in tongues. And they were so amazed and they, they, were, so, they were so encouraged and enamored with what had happened that they had completely lost sight of what it meant. They had taken this gift that signified the redemption of the nations that God is, is coming full circle with his, with his plan throughout human history to call the nations back to himself. And they had reduced the sign to basically a prideful hobby. Instead of being in awe of what God was doing, they were looking at the phenomenon and saying, Isn't this cool? Look what I can do. You do it now. Ready, go. As if that was the thing. Some of you are old enough to remember the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona. I won't ask you to show hands. <clears throat> Some of you don't remember this. You're not old enough. But there was something, I, you, you can watch it as I'm talking to you. But one of the coolest things about the Olympic Games in Barcelona is the way that the Olympic torch was lit. You know, you carry the torch all the way, you know, all, all through these different countries and everything. But then it's handed over to this archer, and he shoots an arrow over top of the cauldron and it lights. And it was really cool. Those of you who, who were alive, if you saw it, you know that that was probably one of the more impressive lightings of the Olympic cauldron that we can recall. Here's what Paul is dealing with, okay? It's like you're, you're now at day 12 of the Olympics. And the church in Corinth is still way up in the cheap seats of the, of the stadium and the Colosseum, and they're still rehearsing in their mind the lighting of the cauldron. It's been two weeks. There's been all kinds of competition going on in the field, and they're not paying attention to it at all. They're just going like, wasn't that thing cool, that arrow thing? You know, they're just, they're just replaying it, replaying it, replaying it, 
in their mind. And Paul comes to them and he says, hey guys, listen, it was amazing. It really was cool. I mean, you know, let's make a video of it. We'll watch it every once in a while. But God began, began an amazing thing that day. And it was an incredible thing to see how the torch went out, not only in Jerusalem, but that torch has now gone out into Samaria in Acts chapter 8. And then it has gone out even further into the outermost parts to Caesarea in Acts chapter 10. But all of this is most exciting, not because of the cool thing that happened at the opening ceremony. It's really cool because of what it marked the beginning of, and that is God calling the nations back to himself. But see, you guys, you're still enamored with the opening ceremony. You're still trying to reenact the opening ceremony, but while, while you're doing that, look what's happening on the field. Look at the amazing things that are actually happening on the ground. God is undoing the Tower of Babel. He has redeemed the nations. He is calling the nations back to Himself. That they might know Him. That they might be part of His family. And that they might join with Him in calling others to Himself as well. Really quickly, I know I'm, I know I'm getting long in time here. Let me give you just two quick applications. There may be other applications that come to your mind, but let me give you just two quick ones that have come to my mind. First of all, I'll use the phrase redemptive relationships. Redemptive relationships. It only makes sense that if God is in the process of calling people from all nations back to himself to be a part of his family, that we would be cultivating redemptive relationships with people that God has placed in our lives. That God has placed people in our lives that don't know the Lord. They don't, they don't understand what God is doing. They haven't found meaning in life in a relationship with the God who made them. They haven't found belonging in God's family. And they haven't found purpose in joining in this mission. So wouldn't it make sense that we would be paying attention and being intentional about fostering redemptive relationships with people around us, praying for them? And praying for the boldness to invite them into such a relationship with the God who made them through faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the first application, redemptive relationships. The second application is ministry that reaches up, in, and out. Ministry that goes up, in, and out. Think of this this way. Worship that glorifies God, as, as Mike said at the, earlier in the service, Worship that honors God has a form and a spirit that honors the Lord. And so in all that we do in our worship and in our ministry, we are called to glorify the Lord. That's ministry that reaches up. But worship and ministry that glorifies the Lord also edifies the body of Christ. It builds up the body of Christ, the family of God, so that we grow in maturity and we grow in unity. We grow in love for God and for one another. That's ministry that reaches in. But worship and ministry that glorifies God also engages inquirers among us who may not yet have a faith in God such that they would hear the truth about God. That God's Spirit might work in their hearts to, to show them, convince them that God is holy and that we are sinners, but that God has so loved us that He sent Jesus to be our Savior, that He has come to bring us home to Himself. That's ministry that reaches out. That our church would be a place where we love and honor God, that we reach up, that we, that we love and build one another up in maturity that reaches in, and where people who don't yet know the love of Christ might come into our midst and they would see and hear 
and worship God and say, God is really among you. Would you pray this way with, with me? Would you pray that God would, would do this? That, that we, would, we would see our need and truly desire and intentionally seek to be a church that reaches up and in and out. That the, Lord would, that the world would know that God has sent His Son. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to we wanna pray to this end. We thank You for the beauty of of this plan that you have unfolded. That the world that you made, the people that you made in your own image turned away from you. They turned away from you to the point that they all came together and they sought to make a name for themselves without you. And you confused their language and you scattered them. And then you selected Abraham, one family, through which you would bless the whole world, all nations. And at Pentecost, you reversed it. You took people who were divided because they all spoke different languages and you brought them all together, bringing them to yourself so that the diversity of the languages, the diversity of the world might be reunified to you. And Lord, you've, you've placed us here in your church and you've called us to glorify yourself, to build one another up in love, and then to join you in your mission to call others to yourself. Lord, help us to be a church like that. Help us to be people like that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, close our service by joining together to sing. Will you please stand?